welcome to Future Forward Podcast, an unusual tech dialogue brought to you by Mastar City. This season, we're exploring innovations and technologies from the future and around the world. I'm Lucy Hedges, former tech editor for the Metro newspaper in the UK. Um, I'm a BBC presenter and self-confessed gadget geek. And I'm Steve Severance, director of growth at Mastar City a world-class innovation hub and pioneering sustainable urban development in Abu Dhabi, the capital of the UAE. Now, over this series, we're going to be focusing on the cities of tomorrow, travelling across the globe to talk to the experts who are making it happen in the cities that are changing the world we live in. So, Steve, where are we heading today? Today, Lucy, we're going to Jerusalem. We're going to meet with our crowd founder and CEO, Jonathan Medved. I had the pleasure of meeting Jonathan at our crowd earlier this year in Jerusalem so knew he would be an outstanding guest for our podcast. But he is a serial entrepreneur, venture capitalist, angel investor in Israel's high tech scene. He's the founder and CEO of Our Crowd, which is a global investing platform and Israel's most active venture investor. He's been named by the Washington Post as one of Israel's leading high tech venture capitalists and by the New York Times as among the top 10 most influential Americans who have impacted Israel. And we are delighted to have him with us today. Yes, we're very excited. Um, and on that note, we are here. So please unfasten your seatbelts and welcome to the Future Forward podcast, John Medved. So John, it's great to have you on the show. So first of all, how are you? I am great today. Thank you, Lucy. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, as Steve just mentioned, you know, you have an incredibly impressive list of achievements under your belt. So I think a great place to start um, would be to ask you what's motivated you to do what you've done and what was the pull to work in Israel um, and specifically Jerusalem? Well, look, I, I came here as a college student, fell in love with many aspects of uh, the life and did not come with a technology background or degree um, and found myself uh, falling into technology and technology business back when there was no venture capital here in Israel at all, not a single dollar. This was in the early 80s, believe it or not. So I guess I ages myself. Um, but I fell into it through an old Jewish tradition called nepotism. Uh, my late father, uh, Dr. David Medved, a blessed memory, uh, was a rocket scientist, surfer, uh, and entrepreneur. And he had a company, hard to call it a company, of a couple of guys working on something in the early 80s called fiber optic communications. And he visited me in Israel and I ended up uh, deciding to join him with no background at all. And together we built the company uh, in fiber optics called Merit, which after about 10 years of hard work, we ended up selling to Amoco, the very large oil company uh, mm -hmm. that was later to become uh, British Petroleum. And that was my first exit. And when that was done in 1991, uh, I came back uh, to Israel. I had left for several years to help him overseas. And when I got back, all of a sudden, all hell was breaking loose, excuse me the phrase um, where there were people were building uh, venture capital funds, there were startups, go, a go-go, and I then got involved in a uh, software startup which uh, went public in the first wave of the internet company called Accent. And then I decided to build one of Israel's first venture capital funds called Israel Seed Partners, which I managed. And I've been back and forth through my career uh, between both being an entrepreneur and an investor. It's really two, two aspects of the same uh, in, engagement, but it's, it's fun to have both perspectives at the same time. So you got your foot in the door pretty early on. I, I've watched the startup nation, not watched. I've been a yeah, part you've of been involved. a leader. In, yeah, I've been, I'm, I'm, I'm like fully, fully committed to this. Uh, endeavor and it's yeah. been wonderful to see because from that moment back in the early 80s when you know and again we're talking about a time when desktop computing was just starting right i mean i was working on early versions of visicalc before there was excel to do my business plans you know there was no powerpoint okay it, it was you know this oh was very early 
Can you yeah. imagine? I know. Like, no, I heart. can't, John. How, <laughs> how did we have meetings? How did we have meetings? I mean, you know, they, they, they say that the best, uh, you know, language that, that uh, venture capitalists speak is PowerPoint, right? So, you know, the, but the bottom line is that none of this was available. I've grown up through it. And the, the cool thing about being involved as either a startup founder or investor is you forever are learning new things. You have to reinvent yourself. And that old 60s slogan, which I was very fond of, forever young, okay, is sort of the, the battle cry, I think, of, of, of the innovation economy. And I think that you and I made similar career decisions that we both left California to come to the Middle East. Uh, and if you look at where, obviously, Silicon Valley and California, where people think this is the home of technology, but you've actually really helped create one, and particularly in Jerusalem. Everyone knows about Tel Aviv, but you've also uh, helped to create one in Jerusalem. And I think what you've done with our crowd has been integral to the, to the growth there. Because what I saw there was not just a, a group of technology companies, but a community that you've, uh, that you've really helped to create around that technology. Yeah, I, I think that the community aspect is critical. When you really drill down on what makes Silicon Valley work, which of course is the archetype, it is not just that there are entrepreneurs or there are investors, but there are all the service providers, there are all the, the founders, the big uh, multinational companies, you know, the leaders who can provide not just funding, but early you know, proof of concept. And you need that group to get together. I mean, it's very difficult during COVID when we were, you know, essentially limited to this kind of communication. But that community aspect is really critical for an innovation hotbed to take off. Now, Israel is in particular highly networked, right? The real challenge, though, I think, in venture capital and innovation is how do you build regional communities? How do we build a joint community between Israel and the UAE? How do we build uh, a uh, a regional community that includes from the you know North African uh, countries like uh, Morocco all the way you know in, into deeper into Asia. How do we make sure that people see each other, understand each other, and 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 really find common ground uh, uh, in terms of addressing together these major challenges facing the world? And uh, th that excites me. You know, I, I went to school at Berkeley. I, I was influenced by or, or formed in, in those years where you believed that you could change the world and the world has changed. Why don't you take a look at that and some of the things, some of the ways that we need to work, make the world better with, with technology companies, particularly around sustainability. Obviously, you know, I'm coming to you from Mazda City, which is Abu Dhabi's uh, stake in the ground and how to do a sustainable development. But with that innovation aspect as well, too. But Israel is obviously facing a lot of the same climate issues that we're facing here. What are some of the technologies that you see coming out of your community that are addressing climate change and addressing the, the need to be to create a more sustainable future and technology companies supporting that? Well, first of all, the, the good news is that one in seven of the Israeli companies now getting venture capital are addressing climate change, which is an extraordinary number. And that's up dramatically over time. Now, you know, there's also just a lot of activity in food tech and alternative proteins, which of course also address climate by reducing, you know, terrible greenhouse uh, gas emissions and whatnot. So it's, it's very vibrant, but the areas range from, that we're investing in range from everything from reforestation to uh, green hydrogen, to indoor air quality improvement and energy efficiency, to nuclear fusion uh, as a, we've got two investments there. Next generation battery technology, obviously, you know, mobility and how to solve that, you know, is part of the larger climate and tremendous amounts of ag tech, how to be more efficient, water technology, right? We uh, in our region, you know, uh, both Israel and the UAE and the broader community, we have terrible lacks of, of water. And yet here in Israel, we are a net water exporter, 
right? We are the masters of water technology, really leading the world in this area. And uh, I, I think there's just so much excitement and, and importance in this sector. But I'll tell you, it's, we're still, as a, as a uh, global community, way underinvested. I've read so much about this. You know, Israel is, you know, putting such a, a concerted effort into becoming this go-to hub for climate change of all this kind of game-changing technology. Is collaboration something that is really driving this forward, you know, working with other territories in order to, to, to collaborate and come together? I, I think collaboration is essential. And, and by the way, we're investing globally, right? We invest both in Israel and around the world. We're investing, obviously, in the Gulf uh, we have announced a, a $60 million project with Abu Dhabi together with ADIO, with the uh, Abu Dhabi Investment Office, where we're building together with Abu Dhabi uh, advanced artificial intelligence um, and, you know, hiring people up in Abu Dhabi. And we, we, we definitely believe in the, the, the power of collaboration and doing it together. We're finding tremendous interest and capability, obviously, in the Gulf, uh, in a number of countries, in terms of next generation energy, hydrogen, uh, energy efficiency, grid software. Um, and I, I think that what was surprising and encouraging to me is how deep and commit, committed uh, countries like the UAE are to uh, this transformation, to putting you know, significant weight, both in terms of capital, but almost more important in terms of government uh, easing of conditions and making sure that there is a, a, a good tailwind, okay, pushing this forward. And uh, I, I find that very, very encouraging and exciting part of, you know, our collaboration with uh, our partners in the Gulf. Well, I mean, I, I'm very excited about that project because I'm sitting surrounded by the buildings of the Mohammed bin Zayed University for Artificial Intelligence, which is headquartered at, which is its campus is right at, as the heart of Mazdar City. So that project will directly impact what, what, what we have going on. A lot of the technologies you've talked about are things that are going to run in the background. Artificial intelligence, hydrogen, more, more investment in renewable energy, battery storage. How about a couple that more directly impact people's lives? Things that we'll see. Uh, I know that Israel is taking a real uh, leading role in mobility, uh, and particularly when we talk about autonomous. This is something that's gonna, that has maybe more of a chance to impact our lives in the, ne in the near term than almost any other technology that's, that's being developed. Do you wanna talk a little bit about some of the mobility things that, that Israel's doing? Sure, so you know our hometown favorite here in Jerusalem is a company called Mobileye, which uh, really leads the world in uh, you know, uh, uh, advanced driving solutions, collision avoidance, moving into autonomous vehicles. And this was bought by Intel for about $16 billion several years ago. But what's amazing about this story is not just that it's a Jerusalem-based company that really leads the world in this critical advanced technology for automobile companies, but that they then, after Intel absorbed them and developed, continued to develop this company, they just went public. They just spun out of Intel in order to continue being an entrepreneurial leader. They're now traded in the US, I think it's north of $30 billion in market cap, which is just wonderful and they're heroes. But you know, you think that the guy behind this, Amnon Shashua, is you know going to be with his hands full with this alone but that's not the way it works with our serial entrepreneurs he's got israel's first digital bank called one zero which he's now uh behind and has been working on and we're investors there full disclosure but he's also got his ai startup which is now you know competing with uh open ai and sort of developing their own version of a, of a chat GPT kind of product. And, and that's really one of the things that doesn't get enough attention, which is that some of these exceptional people, these serial entrepreneurs who build company after company, who invest in other entrepreneurs companies, who are symbols of what is possible, they're the, the leaders of this 
process. And we're very fortunate to have people like that, you know, who are showing us the way. Other examples of uh, cool companies that will affect people's lives directly include, uh, you know, we have a company called Sufresca in the uh, fruit and uh, vegetables in the produce area, where today you know that about half of the world's produce essentially is wasted from tree to plate, okay? It, it's, it's gone. When you think about how many hungry people could be fed if we could reduce this waste. So what Sufresca does, it, and again- it's, it's also, I mean, John, it's also, I have to bring in the climate change aspects of it. It's shocking, I mean, because uh, what many people probably don't realize is that what a giant contributor agriculture is to, to the carbon output. And that we, when we look at, uh, that's, that's shocking that half of the fresh fruit and vegetables are wasted because overall, it's at least a third of our total food is actually wasted. And that is when you look, when you think about growing from 8 billion people to 9 billion people to maybe topping out at 10 billion, uh, we cannot afford to waste yeah. a third yeah. of our food and half of our fresh fruit and vegetables. That's mind boggling to me, John. That's mind boggling. And, 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 to me, it's not just upsetting, it's an opportunity because there are technology solutions. So speaking again of Jerusalem from the Hebrew University, which is here in, in Jerusalem, the agricultural department in Rehovo, uh, one of our companies, Sufresca, they've developed an organic spray that you take organic materials, it's not wax, it's not you know, that weird stuff that we get on apples sometimes from New Zealand, Okay, which I like very much, I love New Zealand. But uh, you can spray now fruits and vegetables and you increase their lifetime by a factor of two or three. Okay, so that a huge source of this wastage simply evaporates. And uh, this is a company which as people adopt it, you can see how much carbon you're gonna save, how many people are gonna be fed. Uh, we have a company called Dots who are uh, building a, a, a essentially an ongoing quality control system for what's called uh, fertigation, which is when you deploy fertilizer together with irrigation water into crops. And we are wasting so much money and creating so much environmental harm by over fertigation, by putting too much fertilizer in the ground. Why? Because we don't know how effective it is. Well, solve it. And so by using optics, this company Dots understands how much actual fertilizer is at the root of the plant. And then you can measure it. You get that feedback. We have a company called Consumer Physics who are building a miniature uh, uh, spectrometer, which can tell you how much protein or moisture or sugar is in agricultural products. So you can literally put it inside a combine. So these big machines that go through uh, harvesting wheat or barley or oats or even sugarcane, they now get real-time information in terms of what the, you know, what this agricultural uh, uh, material is made of. You can even use it to test uh, sugar content in dates. So there is so much. And we haven't even spoken about healthcare and how, how you know, uh, the, the revolution in digital health in r ranging from using AI to develop new drugs to a remote, you know, telemedicine where you can get real diagnosis over, you know, uh, communication networks, provide real medical support either through robots or through individual doctors at distance. But talk a bit about the ecosystem uh, that you've created at our crowd and what possibly other other geographies or, you know, we, what we in Abu Dhabi could, could learn because this is, uh, I think globally what you're seeing also is everyone understanding how important it is to have this innovation ecosystem. Uh, and since you've been involved in creating one, what would you say to other other entities, geographies that would want to uh, help recreate this? Well, I, again, it's uh, we urge people to join us at our crowd. 
We have about 220,000 members now worldwide from 195 countries. I think we're missing just a few. Uh, and the amount of people, the amount of people who came through there, I got to tell you, it was packed. The Abu Dhabi booth was packed from morning till night. Uh, there was so much interest in what's going on in Abu Dhabi uh, from both the, the obviously the Israelis, but also you mentioned from the other 81 countries. We had a lot of people coming over to see us. Yeah, it's it's just it's blowing my mind to just hear about, you know, the innovation that's really coming through and just how this technology is really driving this innovation as well in these spaces like you say you kind know, of water waste management healthcare. I mean the things that you mentioned just now about the, the the technology that's helping really push this space is just incredible you know as a journalist I'm constantly reading and writing about the development of healthcare and all these digi health platforms and things like that and what robots can do and what AI can do and it really is just incredible and of course we're still really in the early stages of it so it's great to hear from you that there are companies that are really driving this innovation um, and they're Get to be put on the world stage to really make this happen. And the idea is to connect these companies with masses of people around the world by expanding this community. So you're no longer just your community in Abu Dhabi or just your community in Jerusalem or just your community in Menlo Park. It's about how do you create a global community which both is virtual okay, online through webinars and through, you know, uh, mobile apps and, and websites and, and updates, but also by getting together physically. And by doing that, you know, bringing the power of the crowd, as it were, on, on as a force multiplier for these young companies, where all of a sudden, they're not these guys fighting in their local environment to get money or to get attention or to get connections, but they've got the support of this much larger entity who are dying to hear about this, who want to know and want to help. That's the that's the goal, and I think that's what's really unique about our crowd at, at the moment. Yeah. So I just want to touch a little bit on you know the Israeli tech ecosystem. What makes Israel's tech ecosystem so special and unique when it comes to the rest of the world? You know, compared to the rest of the world, what is the secret sauce there? Tell us, John. Well, this <laughs> right. You've got a few days, uh, weeks, <laughs> months. Um, it, it, it starts in kindergarten. There's a wonderful book called Chutzpah about an Israeli trait. The word Chutzpah means a lot of cheek, a lot of gall, a lot of sort of daring in your face, uh, dreaming, you know. And it's, it really starts with our, and in, in this book, by the way, the author talks about the roots of, of this chutzpah, which drives our ecosystem. And it, she says it starts in our kindergarten, where in most kindergartens, kids are sheltered, are protected, which is important. If they have a playground, it's been fully certified and is safe and is re remarkable in that way. But in Israel, most kids play in something called the Chatser Grutot, which is, literally means a junkyard. In the back of the kindergarten, they throw a bunch of old equipment, and they can be microwaves, refrigerators, God forbid, all kinds of junk, which looks not safe, and it probably isn't, doesn't look healthy. But what it is, is healthy for the kids' minds. Because you watch these kids play, and they just create the most unbelievable simulations of real life with a bunch of junk. Yeah, I'm a fan of the UAE entrepreneurial ecosystem as it's emerging. I think that we're, we're going to see some remarkable companies being built and started already. No matter where you are in the world, it's more diverse in the UAE. We really have brought, brought the world together, but the problems that, uh, that we're now facing as a globe are more global than ever, that we need to focus this uh, at a global level, that if we are gonna be serious about carbon neutrality by 2050, mm -hmm. which is something the technology companies certainly need to help us out, but so do the governments uh, and, and so do the people and the culture that we need to look at this uh, not at a local level or not at a regional level, but at a global level. I agree with that completely. 
And uh, I think that, you know, what we need, though, are, are some tools that will provide carbon credits or incentives to solution providers and not just to people who are essentially mitigating their existing, you know, production. You mentioned before what's going on with uh, agriculture. I mean, dairy alone is responsible for about 15 percent of global emissions. And I love cows as much as the next guy. And I love milk. OK, uh, but really, we've got to figure out a way to give the cows a rest. But today we can grow milk, right? We can grow milk in you know, fermentation. We have a company called Remilk who are doing it or already in market with General Mills in Michigan, you know, selling cream cheese that was grown in a fermentation vat. And we'll be able to, we think, make milk with this process at uh, less cost than uh, dairy milk. It has no cholesterol, it has no lactose, and yet it's milk protein. So when you think about how you can feed hungry people, how you can, you know, uh, uh, make a healthier product, uh, high in, you know, protein and low in, you know, sugars and whatnot. And on the other hand, you know, not produce so much horrible emissions. That's a great thing. But how do we incentivize the entrepreneurs and the technology companies that will be coming around? Because you rightly pointed out that there's not enough funding going here. And there's often what the tech, what the uh, especially green tech entrepreneurs refer to the valley of death from idea to uh, from prototype to actually production, because most of the most of the technology that will be solving climate change will not be SaaS platforms, will not be quick, easy venture capital wins, but will require uh, physical things to solve physical problems. Deep tech, it, it, you know, if you're talking about food, if you're talking about medicine, these things need are regulated industries. You need investment over years to get it done. Okay, and uh, this is you're absolutely right, Steve. Look, uh, we're going to be at COP28. I hope that we'll be bringing a whole slew of companies. I'm very excited. It's going to be, you know, in the UAE uh, this year, and and I think it will be uh, an important milestone. And hopefully, we can make some real progress there. Yeah. So we've talked about, you know, some of the big spaces that or the sectors that Israel and Jerusalem are really making big waves in, you know, food tech, smart mobility, alternative protein, healthcare. We spoke a lot about that. What are the big jobs of the future in Jerusalem and Israel? Just to kind of finally wrap up. Well, look, I, I think that uh, AI everything, AI is being used uh, and especially generative AI in yeah. so many areas. Uh, in the development of code, we have a company, Tab9, who is now responsible, I think, for either 1% or 2% of the total world's software output. And it's not because they have thousands and thousands of people writing software. It's because they've created an AI bot that helps you, uh, as a programmer, essentially get suggestions from them of how to complete. It's almost like autocomplete you know, you're getting in your emails or in your text, they're mm -hmm. doing it for coders. And that, you know, a big job. The big job of the future, of course, is anything data or AI oriented. And mm -hmm. it's it's and it's for good for good reason, because the benefits are enormous. Uh, we have a company in the medical area called Metaware who are using AI to make sure that you're not given the wrong prescription. Would you believe that at, in clinical trials at some of the best university hospitals in America, they found that 5% of the prescriptions written are wrong, are, are simply <laughs> wrong. That is pretty harrowing. And these are things which will save lives. These are huge, you know, uh, in, important investments. We're investing in space uh, where not just sending up new nano satellites with broadband capability, but how to use space for uh, geospatial mapping and figuring out what's going on on the earth. So one of our companies is taking commercial, the company is called Edgy Bees, 
and they take commercial satellite information and they can literally improve the accuracy by a factor of 10, an order of magnitude, better data. Again, through, you know, uh, simply using the technology available in terms of, you know, visualization today and advanced algorithms. I, unfortunately or fortunately, I can go on because yeah. we have about 400 companies that we've invested. Uh, but that's just the sum of them. John, I knew why I wanted to have you on the show here. I knew, I knew why, I, I think Lucy and I both uh, uh, excited to have you. Thank you so much, Steve. When I'm back in Abu Dhabi and I'm frequently there, let's see if we could do a, a meetup or something. And yeah, I was very impressed by uh, Mazdar City. Okay, we'll, we'll talk soon. Welcome. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, thanks, John. Appreciate I just want to echo um, his sentiments um, and just say, remember, you can hear all of our previous episodes in the same place that you got this podcast. We'll hear you next time.